nenaskamon kah no temtik ke nenaskom tenama kah kiel ke teyak o ke mawa ke skuep napeyo anuts mio kisukal animo tainans manantu ke nenaskom tin as well a little bit in nakota ho metake ape pinamaya to hanspe as well as to kashila pinamaya just a little bit in Korean and Nakoda to acknowledge and say I'm very happy to be here, to acknowledge the elders, the chiefs, the women, the men. It's a beautiful day to acknowledge our kind, loving Creator for another beautiful, beautiful day. I want to say and acknowledge and thank as well our elders, council co-chair Elmer Krishane, always leading our elders. Good to see our Kiteyak, our elders in front here. We thank you, Elder. Women's Council Chair as well, newly elected, Denise Stonefish. Welcome. Thank you so much for being elected. But we also thank Therese Villeneuve for her years of service to the Women's Council. We also want to look and acknowledge the Youth Council newly elected chairs, Andre Baer and Jennifer Abomswin. And thank as well, Yalmer for his years of service there. The Yalmer's in the room. Yalmer should be thanked as well. Yalmer, one stop. To all the chiefs, the grand chiefs, hereditary chiefs, clan mothers, to the ministers that are here, everyone that is here in the room, we say a very heartfelt welcome to the AFN's 37th Annual General Assembly. Of course, we acknowledge everything that happened this morning, the protocols that were done, we acknowledge the pipe ceremony, the elder from Treaty 3, Ralph Johnson, leading us, and all the pipes that were there, and all the women that were there, and the water ceremony that happened as well outside. We thank them for that. And to our hosts here, to Dave Williams for that short, short version. Because when you do the acknowledgement, we know there's so many things to give thanks for and acknowledge. But we thank you for that, for leading in a good way. To Bob Johnson, the veterans, of course, to our drum group, the Fort Erie drum group, to Mayor Big Daddy, I'm going to call him now, to the member of Parliament Gates, and of course, Minister Zimmer, and of course, to our gracious hosts here, Chief Ava Hill. Thank you so much. Six Nations of the Grand River, thank you so much for sharing this beautiful ceremony this morning. <laughs> Regional Chief Day, thank you for your comments, your words. All the tribes here, and I see my, my mother as well from Mississauga's New Credit to thank them, you know. She's in front here, Gina. <laughs> I have to acknowledge her. She always sends great Christmas cards and Easter gifts and everything else. So the Mississauga's New Credit, Chief Laform, to all that agreed to come together and share the land and the resource wealth here as one family. And we talk about that wampum, that treaty, the dish with one spoon, how important that is. So it's with great honor that I stand before you now, relatives, chiefs, about the theme of this assembly, gaining momentum. We acknowledge and thank the tireless work of our regional chiefs and our colleagues that sit up here. Our regional chiefs, we thank for that unity. We thank them for their strength and we thank them for the constructive dialogue. Let me tell you, we have good constructive dialogue, but we emerge and we stay strong and united. To our elders' council, the women's council, the youth council, thanks to all of you because we are indeed gaining momentum. But that doesn't mean things are the way they should be, and it doesn't mean all of our issues have been solved. But it does mean that for the first time in a very long time, there is reason to believe that we are on the cusp of great change. And it's going to take all of us working together to make it real for everyone. Friends and colleagues, it's been a year since we came together and as an executive and as I as National Chief stood before you at our Montreal AGA. And let's reflect upon that year. What's transpired? What's happened? What's been done? and what remains to be done. A year ago, our people had not yet decided to engage in great numbers in a national election that would spark change 
for First Nations people across Turtle Island, but everyone indeed across Canada, there was great change. One year ago, our fight for an inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls was still underway. One year ago, we still had a question mark beside the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as far as Canada was concerned. One year ago, we struggled under that 2% funding cap, a cap that was a great barrier on our efforts to improve lives and build a brighter future for our citizens. So what's changed in a year? What happened? Where are we today? We have a new federal partner in Ottawa, a partner that has pledged to build a new relationship with us, nation to nation, based on respect, recognition of rights, cooperation, and partnership. And we can see the first steps to reset the relationship based on those principles. Today, we've had the pre-inquiry and the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is expected to begin later this summer. Today, we have had Canada's announcement of their full support of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples without qualification. Without qualification. That, my friends and relatives, is the first step towards ensuring that that declaration becomes the framework for reconciliation and respect for our rights in this country. Today, we are moving to ensure that that 2% funding cap is gone, that funding cap that's been in place for 20 years, it's a cap on potential, a cap on productivity, a cap on growth, and today we will sign a memorandum of understanding with the Crown that will work towards the creation of a new fiscal relationship, one based on real needs, one based on total population, on and off our reserves and our territories, one based on long-term, predictable, sustainable funding, and one that reflects your nation-to-nation -nation relationship. I said that a year and a half ago, that when I became National Chief, that I would fight for funding for fiscal resources and that those resources that should be in place to meet the very real and growing needs of our citizens. This year, for the first time, our regional chiefs, your regional chiefs, as an executive, we met with Finance, Finance Minister Bill Morneau, not once, but twice, way ahead of the budgeting cycle. We met with Minister of Indigenous Affairs Carolyn Bennett. We met with Health Minister Phil Pott. We met with Employment Minister Mackaychuk. We met with Public Safety Minister Ralph Goodale. And we all pressed for investments. Investments in housing and infrastructure. Investments in clean water and health. Investments in education. And we made clear that these investments are not only for our people and not only for First Nations people, but they are an investment in Canada's future. That's what this is about. These investments, we say, are investments in human capital. And what better way than to invest in Canada's fastest growing segment of the population? Young First Nations men and women. That's what it's all about. And let me be clear, Canada and everyone else, you are guaranteed that there will be huge returns on these investments in the future. These are investments in a stronger country for all of us. On Budget Day in March, what happened? On Budget Day, we saw historic levels of investment in First Nations priorities. Budget 2016 began the process of addressing decades upon decades of underfunding and neglect of our people's priorities and our people's needs. $8.4 billion was announced over five years. 8.4 billion. It is better than Kelowna. It is more money than Kelowna. But we say, was it enough? No, it's not enough. 
it was not enough to close the gap in terms of the quality of life between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. We know we need long-term, sustainable investments in order to close the gap in the quality of life between First Nations and Canada. No one budget could ever do that. No one budget could ever address the needs of our peoples. Needs which have been allowed to grow for so long and too long. Budget 2016 began the process of investing in badly needed housing, in water, proper schools, properly funded First Nations education, so that we can build a brighter future. One that is ripe with potential and opportunity for our people. The budget was a significant first step. And we're going to continue to press on in all areas. Action is needed in all areas, and we need to keep pushing for that action to ensure that First Nations benefit from the collective wealth of our territories. So yes, a great deal of work has been done in one year. But our theme, gaining momentum, is one that I and the regional chiefs take seriously. There is still much work to do. And as much progress as we have made, the journey is not complete. The funds from the budget are slow to flow. A little slow to flow. So I mentioned to different forums, we're not jumping up and down right now. We've got to get the resources out to the communities as soon as possible so they have real meaningful impact on the ground. They've got to get out there. So we have to keep pushing. Those badly needed dollars and resources that have to be in place have to get out to your territories and your communities. Real meaningful impact on the ground. This weekend, our regional chiefs, myself, we joined the AFN Youth Council and the Muskegawak Youth Walkers. We had the Youth Summit. We talked about the challenges facing youth. We spoke and we listened about the things needed to change and how we're to work with our young, young people. The need to work with them to bring in a new era of hope and opportunity and we talked about the strength of our young people, our young leaders. Now, I always make this point to people. You don't have to be elected to be a leader. You do not have to be elected to be a leader. These young walkers walked over 950 kilometers. 950 kilometers, and they walked for hope, and they walked for inspiration. That's leadership. That is hope. I salute those young people from Muskegawa. All of them for walking a long distance. Walking. Sta yeah, stand. Like, that's huge. They walk to promote life. They walk to provide inspiration. They walk to show that they're young people. There is hope. There is hope. There's inspiration to not make a rad choice. They demonstrated that. We honor you. And there's a lot of young people across Turtle Island just like that. They're fighting and they're helping us in our struggle for recognition about treaty rights, about our title and jurisdiction, the right to share in the wealth of this great country, the right to protect our lands and the environment and the water. All those things to protect the land and water are entrusted to us as Indigenous peoples bestowed upon us by the Creator. We have rights, but we also have responsibilities to balance the environment and the economy, the economy and the environment. It's balanced, no question, but that's our responsibility. When we last gathered in December, Prime Minister Trudeau came to our Chiefs and Assembly and he made those five commitments, those five promises, those five key areas. Remember those five commitments because they were drawn from the closing the gap document that we shared, not only with the Liberals before the election on October 19, but we shared them with the NDP, we shared them with the Green Party, we shared them with the Conservatives. Yeah, we did. Some listen. But we did the lobby before. And so through that closing the gap document, five commitments were made from the Prime Minister. He stood before the Chiefs and Assembly. And he responded, he responded to our request to call that inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. 
that inquiry is imminent. Its terms of reference and the commissioners are expected to be announced later this month, next month. He responded to our ask that the 2% cap on funding end and that it should be replaced with sufficient, predictable and sustained funding. So this memorandum of understanding, which we got support from all of our executive, we discussed it. We're going to sign that later this, day, this morning. And that just initiates a process to start looking, observing the research, the analysis on how to move towards a new fiscal relationship with the Crown. A relationship that allows us to get rid of that 2% cap on annual funding increases and replace it with sufficient, predictable and sustained funding. It is something that will be brought back to you, Chiefs. That's what it's about. We're going to get the work started. He responded to our request that Canada invest in First Nations education. And this year's federal budget saw $2 billion over five years dedicated to First Nations education. And again, that's an investment in Canada's future. He also promised to act on all of our calls to fully implement the 94 calls to action, beginning with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And in May of this year, these ministers, Minister Bennett, Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould, traveled to New York. They went to the United Nations Permanent Forum, Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, to again express Canada's full support for the declaration without qualification again. And I stress that. That is huge, ministers. That is huge. And finally, the Prime Minister responded to our call for a federal law review. And his mandate letters to the ministers call for several key policy and legislative reviews. That federal law and policy review is so critical because we know we're winning in the Supreme Court of Canada. Many, many decisions in our favor as Indigenous peoples. Decisions that respect Aboriginal rights and title, jurisdiction, treaty rights, all those things were, were winning. But unfortunately, the laws and key federal policies have not kept up with those decisions. So the Canada's laws and policies have to be brought in line with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and all of the recent Supreme Court of Canada's decisions that respect treaty rights, respect inherent rights, respect title and jurisdiction. And we know it's no secret that some of those current federal policies undermine the right to self-determination as Indigenous Peoples. And we know it's time to eradicate the outdated policies that all came from a mindset of colonialism and assimilation. We know it's time to move beyond the Indian Act. We know it's time to get back to nation to nation, back to treaty territories working together, and back to creating our own laws and occupying the field. That's the time to exert jurisdiction. That's the time to say we are Indigenous peoples and our laws will take the place of these federal laws and provincial laws. That's where we need to keep going. That's how we get out of colonialism. That's how we move beyond the Indian Act. And we need to work together. And we need to find new approaches. New approaches. In addition to those five commitments made by the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, to our Chiefs and Assembly, he spoke of the need to provide significant new funding to recover and revitalize Indigenous languages. We must ensure that this is supported through legislation and a languages commissioner as called for by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. All of our Indigenous languages are important. All of our Indigenous languages matter. I've said before, these should be viewed as Canada's national treasures. There's nowhere else in the world you're going to hear these languages spoken. If you want reconciliation, if you want to repair the relationship and repair all those damaged relationships that have been caused by over 400 years of colonization and residential schools, then we need to recover, we need to revitalize and value our languages. So much effort went into destroying them, we need just as much effort to preserve them. That's nationhood. 
That's where we need to keep coming back. We cannot lose languages. So we're honored today to have Minister Bennett, Minister Wilson-Raybould with us. Minister McKenna will be here to speak on the environment later on this week. Minister Phil Pot on health will also be here later on this afternoon. We welcome Deputy Minister Lerando is here as well. We thank all the officials for being here to listen. And as we work together in Niagara, we ask that we keep one thing firmly in mind, that the work that we do together, the work that we do in the year ahead, has to make a real difference in the lives of our people. At this time next year, chiefs, friends and relatives, colleagues, at this time next year, Canada will be in the midst of its 150th birthday celebrations. And we know this commemoration will not be a celebration for all First Nations people. Many First Nations people ask, what's there for, for, for us to celebrate as Indigenous peoples? Are we going to celebrate colonization? Loss of our lands? Loss of our languages? Decades of oppression? What's there to celebrate? Then when we think about it, and we stop and think, and we witness something happen this morning through the songs, the prayers, the dances, what we will look to celebrate is that in spite of everything, in spite of the residential schools, which we say is not just cultural gen, but was genocide, in spite of the residential schools, in spite of the control and the colonialist Indian Act that's been in place, in spite of all those things, we're still here. We're going to celebrate our strength, and we're going to celebrate our resilience. We can celebrate that we can still hear Cree being spoken, Dene being spoken, Ojibwe being spoken, Dakota being spoken, Mohawk being spoken, Blackfoot being spoken. And we can still see our ceremonies celebrated. Our young men and women walk in both worlds. They're becoming doctors and lawyers, scientists, business people. Our young people are becoming proud of their languages, their culture, their ceremonies. We're getting stronger, we're getting healthier, we're getting our pride back. The next 150 years will belong to Indigenous peoples. That's what we see rising and that's what we're going to be celebrating. It is also an opportunity, colleagues, friends and relatives, chiefs, it's to educate Canadians. It's an opportunity to educate Canada and the world about Indigenous people's contributions and our great history of generosity, of our kindness, of our sharing. It is important that the first peoples of this land get recognized for our contributions to the wealth and the well-being of all who live here now. The point about being properly honoured as part of those celebrations of Confederation have to be put in place. And that will take more than words or promises. It will take a meaningful effort to get back to the nation-to-nation -nation relationship, to move beyond the Indian Act, to realise our rights and our jurisdiction fully. And that will take each one of us making a commitment to doing things differently. And to those working in government, I would say that the ways of the past are no longer acceptable. The ways and the days of the FSO coming out, dictating the terms and conditions of the funding agreement, the ways and means of bureaucrats coming out, dictating what has to happen, put to the side now. We're going to move beyond and find new ways, new innovative ways of opening hearts and minds, new creative ways to breathe life into the promises the Prime Minister made when he was with us in December rights recognition, respect, cooperation, and partnership. Getting back to respect the true spirit and intent of that treaty relationship with the Crown, a sacred obligation. Powerful words that only can be realized with support of the Assembly here, but as well through the support of the Crown. Friends and relatives, we are gaining momentum, but we know we cannot yet rest. We cannot yet be satisfied. We know our walk for hope, for justice, for fairness continues today and tomorrow. Over the next few days, I look forward to hearing from you all on behalf of our AFN executive, your regional chiefs, all the people who work hard every day at the Assembly of First Nations. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, your energy and your strength. We come together as Indigenous peoples and as nations. We're moving towards a better and a brighter future. Egoze.